City. Three men have been left with minor injuries after a suspected homophobic attack in Liverpool. In the past month, at least four people have spoken out about being threatened and assaulted in suspected hate crimes. Police are stepping up patrols in Liverpool after several homophobic and transphobic attacks in the city centre in recent weeks. I felt ashamed um, when I, you know, I saw um, saw the horrific images that were circulating on social media, where you know victims had been violently assaulted. We see the hate crime that happens every day as well, and we're super aware that it's not just the high-profile cases that we see. Hate crime is happening across the region in increased numbers. One person spoke out, and then another person spoke out, and then a few more people kind of came forward with their experiences as well and um, a lot of them city centre based um, um, where we work and provide our services. My heart went out to the victims that they were you know having an otherwise great night out in Liverpool and then suddenly were faced with a really awful attack. Just think you know of the, 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 the young people's parents are they going to have to sit you know like we did with Michael are they going to go through the same as what we did with Michael. He was a up and coming hairdresser. He was going to be the next Herbert. Um, we called him. I said to him, "You'd be the next Herbert." I'm Marie Cosa and Michael's mum. He had ambitions. He had, he had, you know, he had a, a, a partner. Um, he had places to to be and to go, and he just lived and he loved life. You know, um, if somebody was having a party, he'd be there. If somebody invited him out for a drink, he'd be there. You know, it, that was Michael. And so cruelly taken, you know, yeah. in, in just a, a blink of an eye, really, isn't it, really, like well, you said it? Yeah, well, that's it, you know, and, and through haters, you know, that's all that it was, you know, um, through hatred, you know, for Michael being who he was, for, for Michael being, you know, for Michael loving who he loved. Do you fear that history repeating when you, you see that? And like you talk there about the pain that you've gone through as a family, yeah, you fear yeah. that another family Well, would... I do, yeah, I do. You know, um, you know, it, it's just so simple, you know, just that little knock on the, the head, you know, the, the, the kick to the, the face that you go back and like that young fella. He could have lost his eye, you know, he could have lost his life. Michael's death is, is still as um, relevant today as it, as it was then in terms of the horrific consequences of hate crime and, and people that are allowed to to kind of attack someone for just for who they are. I'm Andy Herring, I'm the Chief Executive of the LCR Pride Foundation. Fatal hate crimes do still happen and it that it does show that okay well yes it was 13 years ago but we still have a lot to do and, and that's the motivation again to, to drive that. Um, these are obviously horrific incidents thankfully didn't, didn't result in anyone losing their life but again that still doesn't doesn't make them any any better. It also shows that again it, it, it's a trend that that's a bigger picture here and I think that as a community we need to recognise that as well and look towards the the kind of bigger causes of what's maybe happening in our city as well. Historically, when we have talked about this kind of stuff in work um, with LGBT youth groups, a lot of them, most of them say that they felt that they have experienced discrimination about their identity but have never done anything about it because they feel it's par for the course, sadly, that being LGBT plus means comes with being um, attacked in some kind of way. Hi, my name is Chris Porter. I am a wellbeing service team lead and LGBTQ plus team lead here at the Young Persons Advisory Service. I would say there's been an increase. It's a difficult one because a lot, a lot of the last 12 months we have had to stay at home, haven't we? We've had to stay isolated and we haven't been able to be social and you would expect then that people might be a lot safer but um, the feelings of safety aren't there. I think that's what I would say. Um, at the end of the day when you're an LGBT plus person or young person you're usually the minority or you could be the only person in your family in your household or friendship group and therefore if you're in a lockdown and you're, you have to stay at home that can really make you feel really isolated and you become really aware of any discrimination towards you. We have seen reports of hate crime um, increasing um, and, it, and it's really difficult because in some ways that's positive that people feel that they can come forward. I'm Chief Constable Serena Kennedy. We need to take a more proactive stance in relation to hate crime. We need to explain to people what it's about, what it means and how it feels. How it feels. I spoke to one of my colleagues um, a couple of weeks ago and they explained to me 
when they leave work and they're walking through the city to go home, because of the way they are, they look, they are continually frightened about, about the abuse that they may get. And that is one of my own staff. And that simply is not acceptable. We have to educate. We have to increase tolerance so that everybody feels free, that they can be them, themselves in our city. I am a transgender 13 year old girl. And I like to live quite an ordinary life. I'm Emily and I'm 13 years old. I'm Emma and I'm Emily's mum. I just feel like it's easier for them to think that it's better to try to upset me now that I'm older and that the older I get, the worse the comments can get or verbal abuse. It makes me feel like I'm alone and it, like that no one's there. What do they say? Are you happy to tell us what they say? Or? Yeah, they've, um, I've been called a tranny and my dead name a few times. And a lot of the time I will lose my temper and I'll start screaming at them. But a lot of the time I do try to like control myself and just walk away. But it is quite difficult when there's a lot of people being transphobic in your surrounding area of your own home. Um, a lot of the time they look like they're doing it just to have a bit of fun with the mates. Because they've all known me from primary school. They've all known me before and after. It's, it is quite easy to talk about like um, any problems I've had because I, I know both my parents are always have always got my back and will help me. And Emily's just spoke really honestly there. Yeah. Um and it's you know, it's quite emotional to hear that. I mean, Emily's obviously confided in you, very open with you. How does that make you feel though when you, you hear her speak like that? <laughs> but I know look that's how she feels and I've been there obviously when she's been getting called these names and she's come home and told me and you know, the tears and, you know, she can really retreat into her shell. Um, and it, it's hard, it's really hard because I've got to sort of try and be a little bit of a grown up about it and not get too emotional, even though you are emotional because it's that's my child that's mm. being attacked. But also on the flip side of it, I've got to try and have some control and understanding that the majority of hate comes from ignorance, especially when there are other children involved. So when there is hate being directed to my child by another child, most of the time it is down to ignorance, upbringing, you know, it's very rarely that child's fault. I've been reported to social services numerous times. I've been reported to the NSPCC. Um, I've had messages telling me that I'm wrong. There is no such thing as transgender. Your child's got a mental illness or I've got a mental illness. Um, even as far as occasionally getting death threats as well. Some people are exceptionally passionate in their hate. There's a lot of parents that'll contact us and have shared um, stories on social media, etc., of really horrific things that happen to their kids who are under 16. And it's really important for me that those young people are um, in people's minds when we talk about hate crime and discrimination because they're not just kids and it's not just a bit of bullying. For me, I don't care if you're 10 or if you're 25 or 35. Um, if you're being discriminated against because of your identity, it carries the same weighting for me. So um, it's important we don't lose that narrative. And parents are often the ones who share that with us for the younger ones. Um, because parents have the initial and best relationships usually with their child um, and will be the ones that reach out and make the referrals as well and ask for support for themselves. There are so many places that you can go to wherever you are in the country. There, there is always somewhere that you can go. There is always a charity ready to support. And also the LGBT community have been wonderful with us. They've So many of them have reached out to us 
especially when we've really needed it. They, they've, they've been fantastic and I cannot thank them enough. One of the things that we don't always acknowledge with things like hate crime is the fact that you are being targeted because of who you are, because of your identity. And actually the impact that can have on a victim is huge. Uh, so I'm Emily Sporrell and I am the Most Side Police and Crime Commissioner. We work with the um, Citizens Advice Bureau who offer a specialist services for uh, victims of LGBT hate crime. I'm also working with Stop Hate UK because we know that some people might not want to always go straight to the police to, to report. So we're working with Stop Hate UK to make sure there is a safe and a confidential uh, reporting line route in for them. In our community, there are and has always been um, difficult conversations and meetings and around um, how much um, police involvement there should be regarding LGBT plus hate crime. The truth is like, um, as we know, the police are generally set up to respond to hate crime. So the hate incident or hate crime has already happened by the time the police respond, um, which is why I wanna focus on preventative and stop it from happening in the first place. So I feel like there is a space for the police. I think that if something is potentially criminal, then it needs to be investigated as such. Um, and that's a good thing. And I think it should be an option for people. But I think the truth is that it's not the only option. It's not always the first option, a port of call. Um, and for example, I think there should be more youth workers on the streets, not so much more police on the streets. And a lot of people sadly feel that there's no repercussions as well. So that when they do identify and share that information, that the you know the perpetrator um, isn't always brought to justice and um, so that deters people from reporting it a little bit. I think it's a fair point because actually we know that the police haven't always got it right and we know that for a lot of um, members of the LGBT community they don't have that trust in the police yet. I have had lots of conversations with the chief constable and I've spoken to lots of the, the frontline officers you know, they are really committed. They want to get this right. They want to provide that reassurance to the to the public that if something does happen, they will take it seriously and they will investigate it. It is difficult sometimes in terms of getting the right amount of evidence to be able to actually get a prosecution. Um, but the more that people report, the more we can start to identify where patterns of behaviour might be, or we can just kind of highlight where the real challenges are so that when I'm going to the Chief Constable, I can say there is a problem, you know, we need to be proactive in tackling it. Please come forward and report it. You may not choose that actually at that time you want to go through the criminal justice process, but as a result of reporting to it to us, we can um, make sure that you get referrals to uh, third sector, referrals to agencies who can help you deal with that traumatic incident that, you, that you've dealt with. I want everybody to be able to walk the streets of this city and feel that they can be themselves. I don't want people to be walking through the streets and fearing that they cannot demonstrate who they are, who they love, you know, which communities they come from. When we talk about education, often we talk about the Stonewall riots, which happened in the late 60s. And here we are in 2021 with trans people organizing rallies um, because of you know the brutal oppression of, of their community, for example. Um, there's lots of parallels there. But you know, LGBTQ plus people have been discriminated throughout time as well. So we know this is a long-term battle. Um, and we know that one of the most successful ways of changing hearts and minds is through education. Um, and that education is a preventative measure here. And that's really, I think, where we feel that um, a lot of energy should be spent um, and focused on in terms of challenging LGBT plus hate crime. So yeah, that's something that we're gonna do um, as in the Young Persons Advisory Service. We're often support the schools over the, from September um, for LGBT plus inclusion. And part of that will be raising awareness of um, why discrimination is bad, isn't acceptable and is illegal. Incidents like these, the ones we've seen, you know, they're, they're not the norm, but it's really important that we're very clear that that's not the norm and we actually take action to try and stamp it out. So I really want to make sure that actually for most people, they will come and they'll have a really great time. Where things like this do happen, I want to know they have support and that they're not being left to deal with it on their own. So working with the bars and the clubs gives them that safe space to kind of just 
take a breath, take a minute, you know, give them a chance to kind of just deal with what's happened or process what's happened, get that support from the police um, if they want it, um, and also then hopefully signpost them onto those other services that can support them. So it's just about acknowledging that actually the vast majority of people have a great time in Liverpool and that's what we want people to do, but we know that when things do go wrong, they're somewhere safe, quiet, where they can just go and get that support. It's so easy for a comment online to be left or or unchallenged or unreported. You don't need to challenge it yourself. Um, or even hate crimes to be reported. It's not just the victim's role to report a hate crime. There is also the people that see it and witness it. We all have that role and we all have a role in stopping that across the board. I'm just stood off Matthew Street and there are so many people coming past. I'm absolutely... <laughs> I've been stood here for about three minutes and people are still coming. There's literally thousands. There's no sign of the end of the crowd. I can't see where the front's gone. Um, and it's so colourful. There's lots of pride flags, lots of rainbow colours. Gays don't go to hell. They go to the <laughs> That was one of the signs that has gone past. If you're against the gays, sashay away. I am gay, bite me. It's right down there, right round the corner. It still hasn't come back yet. There's thousands of people. It's a really good turnout for a really good cause. Loads of people have turned out, different genders, different sexualities, and there's been no trouble. So Liverpool is not homophobic. We won't live in fear. We won't live in fear. We won't live in fear. Solidarity is. Solidarity, it is, yeah. We're in it for one fight, and that's to get rid of hate. So let, let's let's stick to that. And I think that that protest showed exactly why that's important and how it can be done properly. We are really lucky to be spouses. Really lucky. Um, being LGBT in Liverpool, I've always likened to being in a little bit of a bubble. It's just so lovely and warm and protected. They're very good at calling out hate. And, you know, we send a very clear message that actually we don't accept that kind of behaviour in the city. We welcome diversity. You know, we're tolerant, we're inclusive. You know, it's not something that we accept. And I was really proud actually to see how strongly the community came out in support of those communities. But it still gives me kind of goosebumps thinking about it because this was community action in action. This was arranged by a group of like young adults who got together and said enough is enough. We need to raise visibility and be visible in Liverpool and they chose a very central part of Liverpool city centre. But I think the city did wrap its arms around the, the LGBTQ plus community. It really stood beside us, which is what we always want. You know, I always I have this kind of saying, it's like real allies march behind, you know, and, and they support people and they raise the voices of minorities. And um, I really felt like that happened. It's kind of good we are scousers because at the end of the day, we are lovely people and we, let people know, let the world know that there's there's still hope and stuff. Liverpool has been deemed one of the safest cities in the country and we absolutely need to work together to make sure that there is no place for hate in our city. No place for hate, you know, um, we won't tolerate it. I'm committed to doing everything within my power, working with partners to make sure that Merseyside is no place for hate. Liverpool is our home and there is no place for hate in our home. We've got pride in our city, it's no place for hate. We are here to let you know that there's no place for hate in Liverpool and we're proud of being from Liverpool. The world is our oyster and there's no place for hate.